Now, when we move to type two particles, these are particles that aggregate or flocculate during sedimentation. So as the particles are actually settling, what you'll see is that you've got smaller particles. So as these particles settle, maybe this particle collides with a larger particle and what we end up with is, I'm sorry, two smaller particles collide and we end up with a larger particle. So this becomes a large particle. So what you, you get flocculation during sedimentation. Now this can occur after you've added alum, it can occur with lime coagulation. It can occur during wastewater treatment, during primary sedimentation. Um, it, can, it can occur in settling tanks after um, trickling filter treatment or in secondary clarifiers. So here, the, there is no theory that we can use to estimate. So we're entirely relying on experimental procedures. And before I continue, there's one thing that I do want to go back and measure with, mention with all of this procedure. This procedure is only for rectangular or horizontal sedimentation basins. If you may recall, when we talked about upflow clarifiers, because your liquid flow, your, your flow of your liquid or your water is upwards and the flow and the particles are settling down. So your, these are your particles. Your particles are actually moving in the opposite direction of the water flow. So because of that, if the terminal settling velocity is greater or equal to the overflow rate, then 100% of particles are, <clears throat> will remain in the tank, which means that they're removed. If the overflow rate is less than the, sorry, if the terminal settling velocity is less than the overflow rate, then your particles will get carried out with the water and they are not removed. So this is no removal. This is 100% removal. And when we mean removal, we're looking at removal from the water. So they're gonna end up in a sludge in the tank. So this procedure that we just went through here is only for rectangular or horizontal sedimentation, okay? It's not for upload clarifiers. So with type two sedimentation, so we, what we've been talking before is type one, discrete settling, no interaction between particles. With type two sedi sedimentation, as I mentioned, there's no good theory. So here, what you need to do is you absolutely have to do <clears throat> a testing. So what's typically done is that you have a large column like this. The height of the column here needs to be at least as high or deep as your sedimentation basin. So this height here has to be at least must well, be greater than or equal to the depth of the sedimentation basin. Now you don't know what the sedimentation basin depth is yet. 
So it's really based on what your estimate predicted depth would be. And that's for the mo most part based on convention. Um, so these are extremely deep. And then what happens is you've got sampling ports along the side. And you can collect samples with time and depth. And then, so we'll use that information then to design the set, the basins. Now I mentioned that we can get flocculation, okay? And the reason we get this flocculation is that we have differences in settling velocity. So that means that because of that, you've got some particles that are settling more slowly. So our so smaller particles will settle more slowly. Our faster part, our larger particles will settle faster. So this, these are faster. This is moving slower. Well, as this one's settling, maybe it interacts with a small particle and can flocculate. The other thing, we have velocity gradients. And those velocity get gradients can also result in particles interacting with another particle and then flocculating. So the advantage of this is we're getting flocculation, additional flocculation in the sedimentation tanks, and that results in enhanced removal. So you get the sweeping effect where the larger particles are settling faster, they interact with these smaller particles that are settling at a slower rate, creating larger particles that are removed more effectively. Now, I'm not going to go through, I'm not going to start um, this example because it'll take a fair amount of time. I've provided an <clears throat> um, Word file, actually it's a PDF, um, on Lon Kappa. I'd suggest printing or that out or at least having that available for Wednesday's lecture. But basically what we wanna look at is for instance, if we're looking at a detention basin of 60 minutes, what we're gonna do is the way we're gonna estimate this is we have a removal efficiency of 60%. We're gonna to have to estimate what the removal efficiency is here. It's somewhere between 55 and 60. I'm gonna take this midpoint as the depth. We'll do the same thing here. Now here we're looking at the 60% and the 65% line. So we have removal efficiency somewhere between um, 60 and 65% at a depth Look at the midpoint. We'll do the same thing here. We'll do the same thing here and we'll do the same thing here. So basically we're looking at these increments between these lines here. And what we do is we add those together. And it's all based on the fact that the overflow rate is equal to, and we showed this before, um, for a rectangular basin, the height divided by the detention time. Okay. So this was shown previously. Again, this is for rectangular or horizontal flow sedimentation basins, same thing. So what we'll do on Wednesdays, we'll go through an example where I will give you a set of data okay, where what we've done in this case is if we had done a settling um, tank, we, the initials, we have an initial solids concentration. 
we determine the detention time and the overflow rate, or what we want to determine is the detention time and the overflow rate. And we've set this that we want 60% removal of suspended solids. That's a typical um, level of suspended solids that are removed in a primary tank in a wastewater treatment plant. Just since we have a little bit of time, and I've said that this is typical for a primary, just to kind of give you a sense of a wastewater treatment plant. So this is our sewage. This is a municipal plant. We would have some sort of screening device, typically bar screens. We could also have grinders. Um, but what we want to do is remove the large material, no different than what we talked about in a water treatment plant. We often then go into, goes into a grit chamber. So we're remo removing that inorganic material, um, sand, coffee grinds, particles such as that. And then we treat sewage in a primary sedimentation basin. And then often this, then this typically goes on to biological treatment. This primary sedimentation basin typically removes about 60% of suspended solids, about 30% of the BOD. Think about this as what we've done then is we have a sample of wastewater that has been treated through bar screens and grit chambers. We then have um, <clears throat> done the analysis where we've used this settling column <clears throat> to determine the concentrations of suspended solids as a function of time and depth in that column. And then that's what we will use for the design. So to reiterate, we have type two sediment sedimentation and that is sedimentation where the particles flocculate as they settle. So they flocculate, they get bigger and then they we see improved settling. Because there's no good theory for this, then we rely on experimental data. So what we have here are the results of an experiment. What we have is that we have a column such as this, it's as deep as our clarifier or sedimentation basin is likely to be. We have ports along the side. And what we do is we take samples with time and depth to determine the removal of suspended solids. So what you see here is that data. So sam so samples were taken at 10 minutes, 20. Somebody went off for break for a little bit too long. They came back at 35. Then they took another one at 50, 70, and 85. And they were sampling ports at 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, 2, and 2. So we have this data. The initial suspended solids concentration was 20 milligrams per liter. So what we need to do is we need to take this data and put it in a form that allows us to do the analysis. I'm gonna switch out of PowerPoint into Word and I've got the Word document posted on Lancapa. So you can follow along with that Word document. So what we need to do next, as I mentioned, is to convert the suspended solids concentration 2% removal, and not sure who mentioned before about the solution, but thank you. Um, so we have a suspended solids concentration of 20 milligrams per liter. And, and <clears throat> for instance, if we take this or set of data straightforward, we have 20 minus 14 over 20, and that's equal to 6 over 20 which is 30%. So what we need to do and what I've done here 
is I've just taken the data from above and in Excel, I've, con I've calculated <clears throat> the percent removals. So that's, that part's really straightforward. The next part is the challenging part. What we need to do is plot the ISO concentration lines. So what you we're doing is notice here, we have time here and we've got time here. So what we're doing is we're just taking that data, <clears throat> so that time data, and we're just now putting it in rows. We have in the table here, the percent removals. So if you look here, initially, we what we have here is at a depth of two meters and 10 minutes, we have 20% removal. So here's your 20% removal. So for 20%, in order to achieve that 20% removal, we need to wait 10 minutes at, or take that sample at 10 minutes at two meter depth. We'll do the same thing for 30. And this was the 30% right in here. And you see at 0.5, 10, <clears throat> so at 0.5, we have 30%, I should, at 10 minutes, 0.5 depth, if 30% removal. If we look at, this is 50%, and I apologize for writing over the line, <clears throat> but this is 50% here. That corresponds to 20 minutes at 0.5 depth. So this one here corresponds, and the red lines, the red, are kind of the easy ones to deal with because they correspond to the percent removals that we're looking at for ISO concentration lines. So if you look, let's look at this one here. We have 40%. So that 40% occurred at 35 minutes, so right here, and a 1.5 depth. So that corresponds to this one. I'm just gonna put a little asterisk next to it just to. <clears throat> And we continue in this way. So like I said, I, I, the red, the one, the cells in red are the easy ones to deal with. And then what you need to do is you need to interpolate. And in some cases you'll be inter interpolating, for instance, between vertical values. In other cases, you're interpolating between horizontal values. And that it's not trivial. It takes some time. It takes some time. But you, we do this interpolation. And by doing the interpolation, what the goal is is to get these concentration ISO concentration lines. So we've plotted data here, and then this is here the ISO concentration line corresponding to 40%. So we do this for each of the percentage lines. So for instance, here is our 70% line. So this is 70%. This makes sense so far. We then, in order to determine the removal, what we're going to do, and we'll look at here, we start with 70 minutes. So and we'll start, we have to make an assumption. So let's assume that we're designing a sedimentation basin clarifier <clears throat> with a depth of 2.5 meters. So if we're looking at that, we're, we're at this depth right here. And let's start by looking at the, we'll assume that we've got sev 70 minutes. We have to make some assumptions to start with. So if we have a detention time, of 70 minutes, then we have an overflow rate of 2.5 meters divided by 70 meters. Let's convert this to minutes per day. And that 
gives us an overflow rate of 51.4 meters per day. Or you often see this written as meters cubed per meter squared per day. So that meter squared is the surface area. So meters cubed is the meters cubed per day is the flow rate. Meters squared is the surface area. It's Q over a sub s. Again, that's our overflow rate. <clears throat> so in order to find the percent removal, we're looking at this line that's shown in red here. So what we have is we start at the bottom. So this crosses, this is our 50% line. So we percent removal equals 50 plus, we'll take the difference between these two iso concentration lines and that midpoint right there. So it's plus 2.0 is the depth. We will always divide by the assumed height times 60 minus 50 plus 1.3 over 2.5 times 65 minus 60 plus 0.9 over 2.5 times 70 minus 65. I'll go back to the diagram in a second. Plus 0.4 over 2.5 times 100 minus 70. And that equals 67%. So what we assume calculated here, sorry, was that at a detention time of 70 minutes, an overflow rate of 51.4 meters per day, we would get 67% removal. So we're just looking at these distances, you can see here. And we always assume this top line is 100%. So basically at zero depth, we have complete removal. We will then do the same for a second overflow rate and detention time. So we'll take this 40 here. And, and drawing these are not trivial. This is an approximate approximation. And, but if we have, if we look at this line here, it crosses at about 46 minutes. So we have an overflow rate here of 2.5 meters divided by 46 minutes times 1,440 minutes per day. And that is equal to 78 meters per day. So the percent removal here is equal to 40% because we're using the 40% line plus same procedure, take that midpoint divided by the depth times 50 minus 40, the difference between the two ISO concentration lines plus 1.1 over 2.5 times 60 minus 50 plus 0.75 divided by 2.5. And what you choose is your ISO concentration lines is really arbitrary. It's up it's based on the data that you have. And the more, obviously, the, the more ISO concentrations lines, the greater sort of the accuracy. But again, this method is really experimental and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have more than about five or six at my ISO concentration lines. And this gives 57%. So what that says, if we go back here at a 50, sorry, at a 46 minute detention time, we would get about 47% removal. And at 70 minutes, we achieved 67%.
and the goal was 60% removal. So that's what, and that's typical removal one would achieve in a primary sedimentation basin in a wastewater treatment plant. Okay. And so the question is, how do we know what red line to, cho to choose? It really doesn't matter. What you'll see in a second, what I'm going to do with this data in order to estimate that 60%. Basically, you need to be, you're going to interpolate. So you need to pick um, detention times that bracket the removal. So for instance, if I had picked a red line down here, you would have seen, I would have been, I would have had, let's say maybe 41%. And this is just a guess, okay. I haven't bracketed, bracketed that 60%, so I need to pick a third line. Okay, so, what, so once I've done this, I'm now gonna plot detention time versus percent removal. Because remember I said I'm bracketing this value. If I bracket the removal, I've plotted, this is my two data points. So I've got a detention time of 70%, 70 minutes and I've got a detention time of 46 minutes. And at 46 minutes, I achieved 57% removal, 67 out of 70, 70 minutes. What I want is 60% removal. So that occurs at a detention time of about 53.5. I do the same thing for the overflow rate. So for the overflow rate, I have here at an overflow rate of 51.4, I have 67%. And at an overflow rate of 78, I have 57% removal. Draw a straight line, do the same thing. I have 60% here. And that is corresponds to an overflow rate of, of 70 meters per day. Now, we're going to add or multiply by scallop factors. Remember what we have here is a column and we're sampling. We talked about horizontal settling basins as having four zones. So what were those four zones? If you, one is a sedimentation zone, inlet, outlet, and sludge. And if you remember, we have the potential for turbulent flow in these regions or turbulence to occur because of in the inlet zone, we've got flow in, in the outlet zone, we have flow over the weirs and in the sludge zone, we have, and I'll show it you late in just a bit, the scraping mechanism. So that can create turbulence. So because of that, what we need to do is we need to use scallop factors to adjust for the fact that our basin has to be much larger than what we would predict based on this analysis. So based on that, our detention time will take this 53.5 minute, and typically we multiply that by a factor of about 1.75. So we're increasing it by about 75%. And that would give us a detention time of 94 minutes or about an hour and a half. And that is typical sedimentation basins, anywhere from an hour and a half detention up to four hours of detention. So the water is residing in that basin for a significant amount of time. And our overflow rate, we will decrease. So we'll take that 70 minutes per day, we will multiply by 0 0.65. It's a larger surface area. Our flow can't change. The only thing that can change is the area. So the surface area has to increase and that would achieve a overflow rate of about 46 minutes per day, uh, meters per day. So that's how we typically design type two sedimentation. Any questions? Yeah, uh, where did the 0.65 come from? So these are just, they're rules of thumb. 
simply based on experience. And so based on experience, we know that we should increase our detention time by about 75% and we should decrease our overflow rate by about multiply by 0.65. And you'll see that throughout and in much of water and wastewater treatment design, you'll see these rules of thumb. Many of the recommendations that are provided in the textbook are really rules of thumb. They're years of experience, hundreds, thousands of these units that have been designed. And based on that, the industry comes together and says, okay, these are the ranges, for instance, you should use for detention times. If you use, for instance, in a secondary clarifier, actually in a primary clarifier too, in wastewater treatment, if your detention time is too long, then you've got the sludge that sits in the bottom, but that sludge is organic. And then if it starts degrading and producing carbon dioxide and methane, you produce bubbles. You kind of think about it. Here's my particles that I'm trying to settle. So now I produce bubbles from the sludge. These bubbles are going to rise. My particles are settling. What happens? So what I have is a situation where I have wastewater treatment. My detention time is too long so that I start getting biological degradation of the organic matter in the sludge. That produces CO2 bubbles, and it can also produce methane bubbles depending on how, how anoxic. What happens to my particles? Could they get trapped in the bubbles? Exactly, they get trapped by the bubbles. And what do the bubbles want to do? They want to go up. They want to go up, but you're trying to settle the, the particles at the bottom. So what do you think happens to your sedimentation efficiency? It was way down. Exactly. Okay, so because of that, we know essentially, you know, okay, if the detention time is longer than about three hours, we start to see decay. Or if we don't remove sludge on a regular enough basis from that bottom, from then we're gonna start getting biological, significant biological activity, and you're gonna produce these bubbles, and that's just gonna do the opposite. Now there is a process called flotation where we actually design the system to do this, but sedimentation basins are not designed in this way. So for the flotation, would you just scrape it off the top, the top then? Exactly. So flotation system, you actually add air to the system under pressure and then you release the pressure, kind of like when you release the pressure, it's kind of like opening up a pop can. Okay, the bubbles all rise to the top. So with flotation, it's the exact opposite of, of sedimentation. You're actually using the bubbles to bring those particles to the surface and you scrape it off the surface rather than scraping it off at the bottom like you do with sedimentation. Almost think of it as phenomenal, it's the opposite whether you scrape it off the bottom or scrape it off the top. Flotation is used, um, I don't know if they still do it, East Lansing Wastewater Treatment Plant used flotation to thicken the sludge from the secondary clarifier. So I drew the diagram the other day where you had a primary clarifier and then bi you have biological treatment. You have then a secondary clarifier there and they take that and the primary sludge and they use flotation to thicken it. And that's because much of that material is organic and it has a low density and it's actually easier to float it to the surface than it is to get it to settle. So they can actually get better thickening with flotation. On the other hand, at the um, Lansing dye water treatment plant, 
they use gravity thickening because this, the softening sludge is dense and it's easy to get it to settle. So whether you use flotation um, or sedimentation, it really depends on the density of your solid particles.